Major funding for Discovery Road brought to you in part by the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, with additional funding from the National Park Service. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. I'm James Nelson. You know, Southern Colorado has always been known for its many cultures, traditions, and different peoples. And for the Germans, oh yes, the Germans. Their story, impressive, intriguing, and partly unknown. The San Luis Valley. 8,000 square miles, one of the biggest high desert valleys in the world. A beautiful basin of opportunity that many pioneers, homesteaders, and settlers have discovered, including the Germans. They arrived and in no time were making a mark, leaving impressions and adding their own unique flavor to the place. A lot of uh, German influence in Monte Vista. They have two different churches that are Lutheran there. Um, also, there was a German colony up by Villa Grove, and that was one of the first German colonies established out here. A big name in the German past in this area, Hermann Imperius. One look at this old photograph tells some of his story. Painted right there on the building, the words hay, grain, potatoes, all sustenance for people and communities. No surprise he served as mayor in Alamosa several times. And this man's story, Fred Walson. As a young man, he sold cigars, served in the Civil War, crossed the plains, and settled in Colorado. He was a stockman, merchant, successful banker, and was the first mayor of a town that would one day bear his name. In the 1896 county jail, we found the Walsenburg Mining Museum and more than a thousand stories born from a miner's life black and white lifestyle photo collection of unidentified families. Walls filled with reminders of strikes and unions. Steel drills, rusty hard hats and lamps. A piece of timber with pencil signatures telling of a lost worker and lost work days. And this image says it all. Three rows of tired, determined faces etched with soot, grit, and the hope of the working class. They named the town after Fred Walson because he started the coal mining industry in a big way. When the railroad came in in 1876, that gave them the possibility to ship out the coal. And he helped but did not actually open the Walson line and then coal mining took off where it employed thousands each year. Lots of German immigrants made their way to America, including August Sporlitter. He came to Walsenburg in 1873, opened the Sporlitter Hotel and the Sporlitter Feed Store, and here at the World Journal, his descendants operate the local newspaper. You know, it's a little blurry, but, you know, it was a good, good choice. I'm still not sure if that's the way we wanted to go or not. Well, I think, I think we have to own it. That's what we chose, and I think it was the best choice because it clearly shows that he was distraught over the death of his daughter, and it was a way of humanizing him when yeah. otherwise people are going to see his mugshot and assume immediately that he's a bad guy. It absolutely does tie in running the newspaper to the history legacy that we have from Great Granddaddy. Um, one of the things that we specialize in in our weekly newspaper is history. The newspaper is connected to the past and the family story, including Louis B. Sporlitter's writings and storytelling. And he was inspired by his uncle August Sporlitter. No surprise, he became a true champion of the area. So this is a uh, poster that uh, we sprung off of a uh, pamphlet that Louis B. Sporletter created back in 1916 to promote 
the Spanish Peaks area um, based on an Art Deco style of artwork that was popular then. Um, he was one of the first promoters of the Spanish Peaks area. He had cabins up in the mountains that he would rent out. Louis B. Sporliter built those cabins, chronicled the comings and goings of early pioneers, settlers, and legends. He was a writer, storyteller, and a very spiritual person. He was a real philosopher and a dreamer and a um, v very, very learned man. He read insatiably his whole life. He was um, very musical. He he was a, a very unusual man, I think, for the time. And so I guess it was just something that he felt because he read so much that this needed to be recorded. In the mountains where it all started, where trees sway in the gentle breeze, where the carved wood bench says spirit, and where descendants gather to reminisce and carry forward his many messages, we found more of his marvelous chronicle. Sporliter's great-great-grandson trooped through the compound and picked out a favorite log. Then he opened an early edition of Louis B.'s biography, The Romance of the Spanish Peaks. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about Louis B. Sporliter Sr., who uh, in many ways is sort of the uh, historical family patriarch of uh, my family on my mom's side, which is the Sporliter family. Um, he's not the first Sporliter who came out to southern Colorado, but uh, he is the Sporliter who went on to purchase a ranch uh, that we continue to maintain and uh, work and live on as a family today. So here we are in uh, on the Sporliter Ranch, the Sporliter Centennial Ranch in Mauricio Canyon, outside of Aguilar in southern in Colorado. He determined to go to the west and a few months later, after experiencing the usual hardships and dangers of an overland journey by train, stage, and wagon, found himself at a small trading post on the Cachera River within sight of the great Spanish peaks. Louis, as he was popularly known, found in his own words a strange people, still stranger customs, a people that had always lived alone away from civilized communities. These Spanish settlers were hospitable in the highest degree, entertaining strangers with kindness and uh, without reward, living in houses that had neither lock nor key, while every wanderer was welcome, with the door to him always open. Carl Sporliter says Louis B. saw this place in the mountains as a restful hideaway, where you could find peace among the pine trees. And in these books, Bibles, and stacks of letters, long ago measures of growing up and life in the American West. I have a treasure trove of them, uh, multiple stacks of these, and and uh, most of them are dated, and you'd think, well, you know, 13076. Well, what isn't shown here, or what you wouldn't really guess, is this is 1876. So this was some letters that were written to uh, Mr. Louis Sporleader. This letter from the desk of Louis B. Sporleader, um, talking about him being a damn fool in his younger days and he um, appreciates mother's patience with me uh, I should have had a sterner parent uh, May 24th 1934 and then that was in uh, an 1803 Bible that was in German this is the 11th day of July, 1964, and uh, this is Numa James of Denver. And uh, Mrs. James and I are up in one of the most beautiful spots in the state of Colorado, on the east side of the Spanish Peaks, uh, up near the Santa Clara area, at the uh, summer ranch of the Sporletters an old recording in one of the cabins. Imagine the kitchen gathering, each person enthralled by the storyteller, as if their own memories were being stoked with a hot poker while they savor every word of the palavering. The, the conversation thing, I've got to assume that was what was passed on um, directly from Louis B. and his love of learning and listening and interviewing and talking to people. Quite a number of people living in Walkenburg and uh, there seemed to be no <laughs> objection no, uh, no to objection it. No objection to it. <laughs> so yeah. that, uh, that was uh, how Walsenburg became the county seat. 
Carolyn says let's chop it off and go over and eat. Right? Yeah. I want to catch okay. the bell on it. Uh, catch the bell on it, and then uh, let's uh, turn it off. Ready? <laughs> Not all of the stories are sweet and wonderful. World War II placed the family in a precarious place. Even during the war and, and things of that nature, there was only one bank in Colorado that would lend to German you know, uh, people. Um, and so it was very, you know, there's a lot of discrimination uh, for people that were, were Germans. And so, you know, it was, it was a, you go through the struggle of you know having the war with uh, with uh, uh, Germany uh, as a as a cause of so much death and destruction, but the the people that came over here did so much for the area. So this is Louis B. Sporletter's violin. Um, he played this in the Sporletter Orchestra when he came out here, and um, this would have been an instrument that people all over the community listened to and danced to. Um, and it's been passed down through through the years to our family. So it does have a great sound. Um, unfortunately, none of us are good enough to play it properly right now, but it is a very, very good instrument that still holds its tone and tone very well. The Sporletter Orchestra was another of Louis B's endeavors. And of course, family members picked up the violin and his love for music. Music is a huge, huge aspect of Warfano County culture in general, um, and particularly for the Spore Letters and our family. Um, when August came out and had his hotel, one, and then when Louis followed him out, one of the things that came from that was the Spore Letter Orchestra. And they played at the hotel and all over town, and they practiced um, everywhere they could. Um, they played for dances and gigs and just for fun out in the streets. And it was a huge thing for uh, the whole family. You know, Louis played the violin and his daughters um, played instruments and sang, and it kind of got passed down. I think that Louis B's legacy is the recording of the history of a very incredibly special part of the world. Um, and he did such a good job of communicating his love for this area that you can't help but also fall in love with it. Peter Hansen crossed the ocean to America with his eyes fixed on tomorrow. He only had one gold dollar in his pocket. He worked in Brooklyn on a church, later on as a farmhand, where he earned $8 a month, eventually saving enough to travel across the plains and landing in Colorado. When war erupted between the North and the South, Hansen enlisted in the 1st Colorado Infantry. He was part of the Battle of Glorita Pass, a decisive Civil War skirmish. He set up a supply post, herded cattle, and when the gunpowder days of war ended, Hansen opened up a dairy cow operation, peddling fresh milk and butter. He then partnered on a ranch, and then another ranch. A cattle empire was in the making. And I think it was a lifestyle he enjoyed. And I don't think he had originally planned on doing that, but it fit in perfectly for him. And as time went on, he even became a spokesman for the valley. And they ran ads in the newspapers trying to have people come to settle in the Alamosa, San Luis Valley, I should say. His legacy, he was not afraid to work and to work hard. And he brought talent to his work. He must have had training as a carpenter. He built houses. He built sheds, he built fences, he, he built, and I think he built not only things, but people, and strengthened them with his work ethic as well. As the cattle operation grew, so did his reputation for being generous. Years after a man robbed him, Hansen handled it honorably. 
and stole his horse and his gun and left him just just for that so he later caught up with this guy 20 years later and this guy was in bad shape and Pete Hansen walked up to him and said do you remember who I am he goes you stole three hundred dollars from me and my horse and my gun and the guy was terribly embarrassed and he says it looks like you need a little more help so he gave the guy another two hundred dollars out of his pocket he was a generous man not only towards his own family and his acquaintances um, he shared he he became quite wealthy he shared his wealth he said it was easier to feed an Indian than to fight them and he would shoot a couple of his steers every once in a while and give them to the Indians. The Hanson Holdings held a huge footprint in the San Luis Valley way back then and it all started with that one gold dollar. Just enough for a ticket that a young Peter Hanson parlayed into a priceless, memorable heritage. Not more than a thousand people call Antonito home. Located near the southern border, it has that old town feeling and easy does it vibe. A street with colorful murals, a sidewalk perch of clay pots with running water, and a darn good place to get a hot meal. And this whistle stop has one of the most unique wonders in the state of Colorado, just off Main at 515 River Street. The German mansion down in Antonito was built by and designed by uh, Fred Varschauer, and that was in 1912. Uh, he was a rancher and a banker, um, he designed the entire mansion himself and had a famous architect in Denver uh, draw the, the blueprints on it. Uh, it features kind of a blend of that Northern European style and an American craftsman style home. A walk through the mansion is like stepping into a museum. Elaborate woodwork is like a sweeping blanket throughout. Intricate carvings on the floors and the walls. Sculpted precise cuts and corners even the shadows are exquisite in their shapes, giving the estate a cathedral feeling. It's on the National Historic Registry. It's a very magnificent, beautiful home inside and out. The design of it inside is just as pretty as the outside. And um, very detailed, very organized, very well built. Uh, the architecture and the design is outstanding and certainly more characteristic of that old style. More colorful murals and dramatic scenes from the old world act like open-air theaters, while a series of panels offer portraits of some of the great ones. Copernicus, the astronomer, Italian poet Dante, the French writer and philosopher Voltaire, and Abraham Lincoln. The reimagination of this building as a town hall was a reimagination of a, as a focal place for our community to come together. Mayor Aaron Abeda, in his office in the mansion, which serves as the town hall and meeting place for the town's business, Abeda says the early history of the owner was passed down from his ancestors. In the early turn of the century, 1900s, right around the time that he built this mansion, he would essentially serve as the broker for all the animals, sheep in particular, out of this particular area. And um, so the local sheep ranchers would offer up, as they would come down from the mountains in the, in the fall, their animals, and he would take them as their broker, sell them presumably in Denver, and then having sold the animals would return with their earnings and then distribute it to each farmer, rancher. Warshower built a small empire in the sheep, lumber, and banking industries. But when tough times hit, some locals felt shortchanged by his operations and soured on him. In 1913, the German emigrant with the elegant mansion committed suicide. But it's just part of the history, right? And we're at a crossroads of many cultures, German just being one of them, French being another, obviously indigenous people, uh, 
people coming up from the pueblos, uh, mestizos, Spaniards, Mexicans, and then later with the arrival of the train, Americans, LDS. So it's a, it's a beautiful and potent place for people to come to. Sort of has a magnetism to it, I guess. Our visit to the mansion was a breathtaking discovery of opulent fixtures, Tiffany lighting, a beautiful panorama of murals, and a frontier story that fits oh so well in the wonder of the San Luis Valley. The train whistle announced they were coming. Tons of rolling iron cars squealed out and punctured the cold air. Locals knew who was on board, the enemy. German prisoners arriving in Colorado would fill up dozens of camps scattered around the state of Colorado. Initially, when the camps come into town, the people are hesitant. They're worried about, you know, is there going to be a problem here? Hundreds of prisoners and officers ended up in places like this sturdy stone structure in Monte Vista, Colorado, known later as Hope Castle. The prisoners were processed, fingerprinted, photographed, given prison garb and assigned a number, and a variety of jobs, cleaning the barracks, doing laundry, and running the kitchen. In an unusual twist, local German farmers found themselves a workforce. So when World War II comes around, and then these same German farmers are able to hire POWs out of the camps to work on their farms, they not only get to speak German with them and maybe find out what's happening in their hometowns, but the farmers usually fed them a huge feast at lunch. But also, it established that local German community as patriotic because they're producing food for the War Department, basically. They're producing food for the war effort. They're using POWs for labor, so they're not tying up the few able-bodied young men who are still in the neighborhood. So it's a win-win. The German soldiers were not the only workforce. In turn, Japanese were on the clock. And what naturally happens when people co-mingle? Well, it happened on an onion farm in South Central Colorado. There were different work schedules. So the German POWs would work one shift and then the Japanese internees would work another shift. But of course, they'd pass each other on the way in and out. And so naturally, friendships developed. The friendships turned into a wartime romance and escapes from the camps were not uncommon. Soon, three Japanese sisters found themselves deeply involved in a prison break, replete with a map, cash, a getaway ride, and kissing photos. It was an international scandal. Ended up uh, giving them a map so that they could escape. And um, there was some romance involved so that the men did escape the camp at Trinidad and they were captured in New Mexico. On these men, they found the map, but they also found the pictures of these guys with the girls. And one of them showed this couple kissing. Well, this is not only politically a problem because our two enemies were the Germans and the Japanese, but it was another problem because in many people's eyes, it was misogynist and you, to have two races mingling that way was just appalling. And the fact that there was a photo of the kiss implied that there was a whole lot more going on. It was a titillating story that swept across the country. At the trial, the lawyer for the sisters claimed the case was about love, not treason. The jury meted out a mild punishment and the sentences were served out. The way that the timeline for the war and everything else works out, by the time the last woman who had served 24 months was released, her family was leaving Granada to go back to their home in California. So really it was uh, something had to be done. Okay, we'll do this. But really it was no more punishment than that it certainly didn't equal what one would consider punishment for conspiracy for treason. There is an intriguing real movie ending to this story. The war ended and the POWs went on with their lives. 
For Captain Till Edward Kiefer, who squeezed vegetables into brown dye, dunked his uniform in the concoction and slipped out of captivity on one of his escapes, there was a surprise and happy ending after the war. He worked in the movie industry and had a role as a guard in The Great Escape. Strong families, remarkable people, and compelling stories, all part of the German way in Colorado. I'm James Nelson. We'll see you next time out here on Discovery Road. With fear. Now these bones that lie empty at home are ready for gladness and cheer. sounds of your home while the north wind delivers its sermon of ice and salt water